Well, grace and peace to uh, you, dear folks, at Onikawa Bible Church, and for those who are part of being a part of the conference in the last couple of days. Uh, put your hands up. How many of you are here from, uh, for the conference? Is there any here? Okay, great. Well, welcome, and glad you could be part of this. I want to bring you greetings this morning uh, from the elders at Grace Church of the Valley, and I know that uh, they have been praying much for this and praying for uh, the conference and praying even for uh, this message this morning that God would use this uh, message uh, in our hearts today. I want to tell you just a little story this week, this last couple of days. I had the joy of um, transporting, picking up children and transporting them back home, and there was a little girl named Kaylee. Kaylee comes from a broken home. Her dad and her mom are divorced. Um, she doesn't understand what divorce is, but she just knows dad lives in, a, in one home and mom lives in another. She's a needy, really needy child. And uh, right from the, the first time I, we picked her up, she was the first child we picked up on our route. And uh, right away, I knew this little girl, God had something special for her this weekend or this last week. And as she came week after week, she's involved in the program that Benji runs, and as she came week, day after day and session after session, there was a point where she just said, we were sharing the gospel with her, and she said, you know, she got in the van one morning, she said, this morning I prayed to God for the very first time. And it touched me, and it made me realize that what we're doing here has eternal ramifications. It's life-changing. It's transforming. I want to thank um, Phil and the elders here for uh, welcoming us and, and just making us feel so much at home. And I know Joe Bali uh, doesn't want to get praise, but Joe, uh, wherever you are in here, I can't see you this morning, but wherever you are, um, that's a five-star plus job that you did for us, and we really appreciate that from the bottom of our hearts. Well, in this message this morning, I want to wrap up the conference with a continuation of the same theme of oneness. Uh, in my messages on spiritually healthy marriages, I've addressed a commitment to oneness in marriage and a commitment to oneness in communication. And this morning, I want to continue the, the theme on with a call to a commitment to oneness in the local church. And as I said right at the start of this conference, the reason we call these commitments is because spiritually healthy homes, spiritually healthy marriages, and spiritually healthy churches require a lot of work. They require you and me to be intentional in the things that we do and to be devoted to the things of Christ because uh, we have a gospel, we have a message, a transforming message uh, that, that we are able in this life by the power of God to give glory and honor to God. The Christian life is not passive, is it? Uh, faith is a belief that engages us in action. So you say faith is belief times action. As I think of this theme of oneness, oneness in the local church, my mind this morning went to Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, and he prayed to the Father in that prayer for his future bride, the church, saying, verse 20 of John 17, I do not ask for these disciples only, that's his 12 disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you and me, the disciples became apostles, they laid the foundation of the church, they preached Christ, no other foundation can any man lay but that which is laid in, is in Christ Jesus. Uh, and then from there, the church has rolled down through the years to us today. Their word, the doctrines, the faith, the once for all delivered faith to the saints, that once for all message has come down to us. And Jesus is praying for this and he says, I pray for those who will believe in me through their word that they all that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I uh, am in you, and they also, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, uh, that they may be one, even as we are one, I and them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know you have sent me and loved them, even as you have loved me. 
What an amazing prayer. What an incredible prayer. That our Lord Jesus Christ, on the, the, the very precipice of the darkest, most terrifying and difficult moment in his life as he faced the cross, would pray for you and me. He would pray for his church and that he would pray that we would be one, that we would be united. And sadly, there is huge, there's a huge amount of disunity within Christianity today. There's, dis, there's denominational disunity, but there's even disunity within denominations, all the way down to disunity in the local church. And disunity at its very core is a worship issue. It's a worship issue. If you, if you don't remember anything else out of this message, remember that, that disunity in the local church is a worship issue. Issue because God is not divided. God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy 6 4. The statement that opens the great Shema was truly a radical statement in the day that Moses proclaimed this because all the other nations of the earth at that time were polytheistic. They worship many gods, and yet Israel was to worship one God, the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and on and on we can go until we get to us today, the God of Andy and Phil and Dave, and you can put your name in there. And honestly, this is critical. This is so important because because if there are many gods, there would be no way that we could then fulfill the next statement by Moses in Deuteronomy 6.5, this command to us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. There's no way we could fulfill that. If there were many gods, our love would be divided. Which God would you love the most today? Which, which God uh, would dominate your attention today? And so our worship would be divided if there were many gods. And our worship, because it's divided, would then be diminished. And, and we would all agree, would we not? That even though we know this reality of monotheism, that there's one God, we would all agree that there are times, that times, that there are times when it's difficult. It's almost like unity is elusive. We see disunity flowing from issues of favoritism and church polity and philosophy of ministry? Where do we stand on things like social justice and critical race theory, government policies? All of these things divide us. COVID vaccinations or no COVID, mask or no mask, men's and women's roles in the church, modesty and immodesty, divorce and remarriage, parenting, and the list goes on and on. And the point is there are, there are many challenges there are many challenges to us because there are many opportunities in any local church to sow seeds of discord. And what that does is it weakens the very fabric of what Jesus has prayed for, that we would be one, one people standing united, standing together, giving the glory and the honor to God for everything, everything that we have in this life. Where there's disunity our worship becomes stained with idolatrous thoughts. As we raise up other gods in our minds and our hearts, we violate the first of the Ten Commandments, which states, you shall have no other gods before me, Exodus 23. Now, this problem of disunity, it's been around since the inception of the church, right? Right? And we come to the New Testament, and we come to one of the letters that Paul wrote uh, in the New Testament that really, you could say, is perhaps the, the, the one letter that shows 
the fullest extent of disunity in the church, and that's the, the letter to first to the Corinthian church. And I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to First Corinthians chapter one. And we're going to look this morning at verses ten through seventeen. First Corinthians chapter one, and we're going to look at verses ten through seventeen. Read along with me as we come to this, the word of the Lord. Apostle Paul is writing to this church under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, and he writes in verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers, And what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did also baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Father, as we come to this text, Lord, would you open our our hearts? Would you give us receptive hearts and ears to this, your word, help us understand it, help us embrace it, and Father, change us and grow us to be more unified, to desire more the glory of your name, that our worship would be seen in every way, and the way that we as a community of your people live and walk and speak and function together here at OBC. Father, bless this message, we pray, for your glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to show you from this text three steps required for you and me to experience unity so that God might be glorified here at Onikawa Bible Church. And we're going to see those three steps are simply this, that if we're to overcome disunity, it involves firstly, heeding God's appeal for unity. Secondly, identifying the obstacles to unity in the local church. And then thirdly, applying the means to unity, the means that God has given us to unity. So the first step, let's talk about this. This is in verse 10, heeding God's appeal for unity. The Lord, through the Apostle Paul here, declares, Now I appeal to you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The tone of Paul's exhortation is, it's not a demand. It's not, it's not a heavy-handed command. It's, it's in, the, in the, Greek word, the Greek word here for uh, appeal is the word parakaleo. And it means to call alongside. And so Paul here is, is operating on this gospel principle of calling others by speaking the truth and love to come alongside him in this matter. As I think about this, I'm reminded that that's the role of any shepherd, isn't it? It's the role of any elder to call people to come alongside them. Because to leave people in a divided state would be, to be, would be to act in an unloving way because while you're divided, you are not honoring the Lord. While you're not honoring the Lord, you're grieving the Spirit. While you're grieving the Spirit, God's blessing cannot fall on your church. And I know it's Christ's church, but He's called you to this church to belong to it. And so Paul is lovingly exhorting his brothers and his sisters in this family in Corinth to to listen to him. I appeal to you. But notice, he doesn't just give a general appeal. It's linked to something. He says, I appeal to you. And here's the authority of his appeal. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so though he is addressing here what I would consider a, a, a church matter, a family matter, it is also a serious matter that has to be considered in the light of the person and authority of Jesus Christ, who is both the foundation and the head of us, the church. And so we see in this that the basis of all unity and progress in the church to greater unity as believers is a willingness then to submit to all that Jesus is and wills for us. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Do we believe that? Do we believe that? You can say yes. It's okay to talk, right? Do we believe that? So at the same time, God has called us as a church And Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that we exist to the praise of His glory. Do we believe that? Yes. Yes. Amen. Not so sure on that one. But we believe that. Do you ever get them to say yes and amen? You should, you know. It's just, we've got to communicate, right? So, what Paul's modeling here, and I want to speak to the elders in this church just for a minute. What Paul's modeling to you as elders, to you who are shepherding this church, is that shepherding involves a heart that's appealing and bringing exhortation by way of instructing others. And the goal that, we'll, that, that, that the elders consider here, and that we all consider here, is what Jesus has called us as a church to do. And that's what elders do. Elders constantly are instructing you. You might wonder, well, why do we spend, every time we get together, the Word of God gets open and, and, and you know, it's preached, Phil gets up here or someone else gets up here, one of the elders, and they teach and our children are being taught right now. And why do we do that? Why does God's, God's word get elevated and lifted high amongst us? Because it's through the word that we get instructed and we, and we learn and we grow in discernment and understanding and love for Jesus Christ. There's no other way. It's not about our feelings or our emotions. And I'm not discounting the fact you have feelings and emotions. God's given them to you. But what it's about is the truth. And our feelings and emotions need to come in line with the truth that God has revealed concerning Jesus Christ. And so every elder, as they deal with division, and they will deal with division because good elders deal with division in any church, must do so with a balance of tenderness to the people they're dealing with alongside the solemn authority and instruction of God's word. Think about this. To be overly tender and ignore the issue at hand would be to pass over the truth. That wouldn't help you as believers in this church. You need to know the truth. To be overly authoritarian and demanding of the believers in the church would lead to, would be an evidence of a lack of love and would lead to a hindrance in the church becoming one people. Now come back to the text, and and let's see how Paul goes about addressing this issue of disunity in this church that's full of disunity on every level. First notice that he instructs them all to agree. He instructs them all to agree. Literally, the meaning here is to speak the same thing. Well, how do we do that? How do we speak the same thing? Well, we do that by submitting ourselves to the authority, person, and purposes, and word of Jesus Christ. We do that by taking every thought captive to Christ, 2 Corinthians 10.5. We do that by engaging the mind of Christ that we've been given. We do that by placing ourselves in submission to the word of God and the Holy Spirit of truth. And as we do these things, we are to align ourselves with Christ, being in harmony with one another rather than take, talking past one another, against one another, and, and, and destroying that unity by not loving and fulfilling the calling of walking out or living out the truth in love. Back up in verse 9 of this chapter, Paul is describing who the church is, and he says this, he says, God is faithful by whom... You were called into the fellowship, that word means the sharing or the partnership 
of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. What unites us here this morning is not that we belong to some specific denomination or that we have some kind of uh, commonality in, in some national body or even local body of uh, or organization, but what unites us here, and by the way, you're, you're as mixed bunch as G, GCV is. Um, there's, there's South Africans here, and there's Kiwis here, and there's Americans here, and, and, uh, and there's Polynesian people here. There's, I met someone from Tonga, uh, Samoa, you name it. We're, we're all from different backgrounds, but what unites us is this fellowship that we have miraculously, by the power of God's Spirit, been brought into, in fact, Paul says in Corinthians, we've been baptized, immersed into this body of Jesus Christ, this body called the church. In other words, we are to agree then to the person in this room, if you belong to this church, you're to agree to the person and to the work of Jesus Christ. We are to agree that he, Jesus, is the fullest expression of God, that he is the knowledge of God, that he is the wisdom of God, that he is God in very flesh, divine in human flesh, the divine being revealed to us. We're to agree to that. And if we agree to that, then that means that everything we do and everything we say and everything we think needs to go through that grid of submission to His name and glory. We are to agree that He is the full expression of the, the written word, which literally points to Him, the, the incarnate word. And when we do that, we will find Unity. Now, Paul is not saying here that all Christians must agree on all things, even all things in the Bible. There are some things in the Scriptures, let's be honest, that are difficult to understand. They just are. Peter writes about this and says of Paul's writing, there are some th things very difficult to understand. There are also, as we know, uh, while there might be one meaning to the text, there are multiple applications from that text to the individual's lives that are hearing the word being preached. The Spirit of God takes the word of God and that true meaning of the word, and then he applies it in, in a hundred different ways. Or let's say there's 200 people here today, 200 different ways. What Paul is saying here is not that he wants us to just all be in lockstep, as it were, in our thinking. He wants you to be a thinker. He wants you to evaluate and test things, and, and there will be disagreements. He even says that in First, first Corinthians. He says there's going to be disagreements among you. Uh, for what purpose? So that those who are approved might become evident. And what he means by that is that those uh, those who are approved are those who have brought themselves in submission to and line with the Word of God. That's what he means. And they're approved because they have submitted their minds and their hearts and their lives to the truth of God's Word. Not personal opinion, not preferences, but to God's Word. And these are the ones that are approved. They become our teachers in the church they become the ones that lead us and guide us into all truth through the work of the Spirit. So Paul's not saying you need, to, you need to somehow get agreement on every little detail. What he's saying here is that regardless of the difficult texts, regardless of the different applications, we are not to let division enter the church. We are to live in the midst of our understanding of Christ to His glory. And what's really good about that is that that means all of us are on the same level. I'm no more, no more important than any other person in this body. Every member of this body is critical to the well-being and the health of this church. Every member. Now, the context of this appeal, of this appeal by Paul, is 
of course, the church of Corinth, and that the church is divided over their church leaders and teachers. And this kind of disagreement is unacceptable to the apostle. And so this call to agree is a priority issue to Paul, and he actually spends the first four chapters of Corinthians focused on this. And therefore, we could say that verse 10, this verse that we're looking at right now in chapter 1, is really the foundational call which addresses all the wider divisions Divisions that were going on in the church of Corinth. Divisions of teaching regarding morality, divisions of lawsuits against other believers, division, divisions over marriage and what, makes, what constitutes marriage and doesn't, and divisions of what you should eat or not eat, food offered to idols or not, uh, divisions over the conduct of women in the church and the exercise of the spiritual gifts, divisions over the Lord's Supper and over the resurrection of Christ. All of these divisions were just rolling around, twirling, swirling around in the, in the life of this church. But listen, if there's no heart's desire to be in agreement under the headship of Christ, if there's no heart's desire to line up under Christ's person and purpose and will for our lives, then it's impossible for us to ever resolve any divisive issue in a God-honoring way. And so for the sake of Christ, Paul is saying, I want you to think, speak, act in the same way that is true and honoring to Christ. So when Onikawa Bible Church values and honors Christ, and the union that we have together in Him, and when we seek harmony with each other over and, over our, over and above our traditions and personal desires and opinions, then we will experience unity and there will be no place for disunity. Now, the, notice secondly what he does. So first he appeals. Secondly, he instructs them that there be no divisions amongst you. And that word is uh, the Greek word schismata, from which we get schism in the English. A schism is simply a division or separation which brings about discord and disharmony. And Paul is calling them here to mend the brokenness in their relational in their relationships. There was disharmony between brothers and sisters in this church. He doesn't want us to be a bunch of clones, but he wants us to be unified. Every one of us is gifted differently. Every one of us is molded and shaped differently and created differently. But we all are to come together to the honor and work together to the honor and glory of God. God has given the church all that it needs to be unified. We have the headship of Jesus Christ. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit of truth. We have the unchanging word of truth, the God-breathed word. We have the plurality of godly leadership, and we have the directive to be a submissive congregation. All of these things are gifts from God for our good and His glory. Now, notice thirdly, that he calls them to communicate so that they are on the same page. He says, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. He's talking about thinking here. He's talking about uh, a purpose and goal and motivation. And, and the main to be verb here is in what's called the subjunctive mood, and I don't normally do this, but it just speaks to the, to the potential of something. So he's writing to a church that's full of discord, and he loves them. He, he calls them a church. He loves them, and he desires the best for them, and he knows that they're a mess. But he says, hey, there's a way forward that you might be, here's the potential, united in the same mind and the same judgment. Wow. What a gracious apostle Paul was. What does all that mean? Well, Paul is here directing the believers to, out of a heart of humility as they come to God's Word and submit to that, and because, of the, because this command is in, in also in the present tense here, that they were to submit to the Word of God and continually be submitting themselves to the truth of the Word of God. And they were to do that in both their thinking, their mind, and their judgment, uh, that is their purpose and goals. So dear believer, you are to constantly seek 
to be unified in gospel truth. You are to think as Christ thinks. You are to do as Christ would want you to do. And Paul is laying down the pathway here toward unity. This pathway includes agreement. It includes mending relationships. It includes intentional, harmonious life together, all centered around Jesus Christ. Now, this is what happened in the early church back in Acts chapter 4 and verse 31 to 32 where it says, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathering was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they continued to speak the word of God and now the full number of those who were saved were of one heart and one soul and they had everything in common. I think we all long for that. I think we all desire that. We all want that kind of unity in the church. But it is elusive at times, for sure. In Romans 15, 5, Paul states, Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus In other words, Christ only has one mind. Christ only has one will. Christ only has one purpose for the church. And so Paul wants believers to strive for the unity that he already has provided us. We can't manufacture unity. We are to be diligent, though, to preserve the unity of the Spirit. We already have that unity. We're just to, we need to discover it. We need to walk in it. We need to preserve it. Philippians 1.27, conduct, conduct yourself, Paul says to the church of Philippi, in a manner worthy of the gospel, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear you, hear of you, that you are standing firm, listen to this, in one spirit, That's not big S, that's little s. One spirit, that there's one heart, one mind, he says, with one mind, striving together, listen to this, for the faith of the gospel. So whatever else there is, it's not not very important, is it? The gospel, the good news concerning Jesus Christ, is that which is most important. In Philippians 2, verses 2 and 3, he says, Make my joy complete, how? By being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Again, understand this. You and I can't create unity. We can't create it. But we can certainly strive for it. We can certainly preserve it. We can certainly guard it. And we need to guard the unity that we all have in Christ. And that, that, that involves us doing some things, controlling our tongues. It involves us thinking rightly and acting rightly towards one another. And that's the challenge of the Christian life. But you know, that's the great exciting part of the Christian life. We don't always get it right. But in Christ and through Christ, we're able to find forgiveness and mercy and help in those times of need where we step misstep or sin even towards a brother or sister in Christ. We can maintain this unity, we can strengthen this unity, or we can destroy it. But remember this, there is only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. Just one. That's the unity we stand in. We need to fight for that, strive for that. Well, there's a second step I want to take you to. The second step uh, to unity involves identifying some uh, some of the obstacles to unity. And what Paul reveals here uh, is, is what he's doing now is he's revealing and explaining and exposing the obstacles in verses 11 through 16. So firstly, we see the issue in the church of Corinth being revealed. He says, For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now, Chloe 
was probably a prominent businesswoman from Ephesus with business interests in Corinth. Ephesus and Corinth weren't very far apart, big cities, and, and she was probably a woman in business, and they were trading backwards and forwards. And she would send her servants there. And Paul was at the time in Ephesus when he's writing this letter. So he had heard from some of Chloe's people that there was some quarreling going on. And it's really interesting because there was a letter written to Paul at the same time and delivered to him, but the letter didn't actually explain the quarreling. The the quarreling came out of a conversation between the men who delivered it and Paul. But why do we quarrel? Where does your mind go when you think of that question? We should go to James chapter 4, shouldn't it? James chapter 4 and verse 1 says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire, you do not have, so you murder, you covet, you cannot obtain, so you fight, and you quarrel, and do not have, because you do not ask. And when you do ask, you ask with selfish desire and ambition. Paul put it this way in Romans 16, 17. He said, watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. Notice that it says of them uh, that such people, in Romans 16, such people are not serving Christ, but their own appetites. What causes quarrels? Our appetites, our passions, our desires, Those are the things that cause quarrels. So there's the issue revealed. There was quarreling going on. There was selfishness in this church. There was people wanting their own way. But what was behind that? What's the the context here? Well, let me explain the issue. Here's the issue explained, verse 12. Uh, Paul says there there was this party spirit going. He said, now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, or Aramaic for Peter, or I follow Christ. Now, we need to be clear at this point. I want to make this abundantly clear to you. This is not testifying to these men teaching different doctrines. Paul, Apollos, and Peter, or Cephas, all proclaimed the same message, which was Christ and Him crucified. However, they were very different men. They were, very, they were differently gifted. And Paul was a brilliant thinker. And he was despised by the Judaizers because he, he could tie them up in knots. Peter, on the other hand, was seen as the standard of orthodoxy in the Jerusalem church. Apollos was a man, the Scripture says, who was eloquent in speech And what was going on in Corinth was that the Corinthians were elevating one over the other depending on who they considered would help them and their own identity and progress in the Christian life. The identification with Christ here, some of you say, and I follow Christ. You say, what's wrong with that? Aren't we meant to follow Christ? Of course you are. He's not dealing with that. He's dealing with this partisanship. He's dealing with this idea where these people had taken Christ And said, I follow Christ as a prideful proclamation that assumed that this group had a step up, a leg up on all the other believers. There's pride in this. There's partisanship. And there were several factors that in the history of this church contributed to this party-minded spirit. Spirit Corinth was a a, a broad... uh, educational city. It was, it was a place where all of the latest ideas uh, would be proclaimed and people from all over the place would come. There was, uh, it was a city with the, the, the elite, as, as it were, and the highly educated, and yet there was also the underprivileged and the poor and the middle class. This was a broad city, but the city was filled with teachers, with philosophers, all vying to have their voice heard. And what that led to was personal patronage, where a philosopher would draw people to himself, students to himself, and would gain their loyalty. And in Corinth, the way to get ahead uh, was connected very much with who you aligned yourself with, the expert of a particular belief system or 
or idea or philosophy. And if you aligned yourself with that person, then you would be considered, you would get elevated, you'd get identified, you'd have this identity that I belong to this person. Now you say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, patronage, that kind of patronage, is an attempt at self-validation. It's a, it's a self-validation. It's by means of another person's successes or popularity that you're elevating yourself. It's self-centered. The more prestigious, the wealthier, the more upper class, the more honored my patron is, my teacher is, by my association with them, I too will be honored. I too will be elevated. I too will be viewed as someone extremely important, valuable, and praiseworthy. If you read the New Testament, you discover that's the exact opposite of how we're to see ourselves. We are to deny ourselves. We are to consider ourselves the lowest of the low. We are bond servants of Jesus Christ. That's how we're to see ourselves. I've just thoroughly loved coming this week to serve you. I'm your servant. Sometimes people come and they sit in a counseling class with me or counseling time with me and and, and I know they're looking up to me. And I have to say to them, I want you to know, I don't have all the answers. I know who does, but I, I don't have them all. But I also want you to know, I'm not your leader. I'm your servant. I'm going I'm to serve you. And through that service of bringing you to the truth, I'm going to lead you to the one who should be your leader, which is Jesus Christ. Now, this idea of self-validation, seeking validation in someone else's success is all too common in our Western culture and churches. We often speak of the school or the educational institution that we went to, not so much as a measure of the quality of one's education, but rather as a validation of who I am. Quite frankly, I don't care what school you went to, and nor does God. What he cares about is whether you have embraced his truth, his reality, whether you're walking in the truth, whether you're truly in step with Jesus Christ or not. Now, on the church front, we often often have to deal with uh, the, the issue of celebrity pastors or popular Christian musicians whom people flock to because they feel validated by being a part of this, this wonderful group of people. Well, is Jesus enough for you or not? Because he's enough for me. Quite frankly, you don't need me, and you don't need Phil, and you don't need Casey or any of your other elders here. You need Christ. And your elders are bondservants serving you and pointing you to him. That's the idea of what leads to humility amongst us and a growing in unity. There's a third issue here. That the issue gets exposed here in verse 13. Verses 13 through 16, Paul points out three truths about Christ. And this is where he really drives home the whole reality of, of how to, to have unity. He asks these re- three rhetorical questions. Notice them. Each one has a, an, a, an emphatic answer. It's a yes or a no. So firstly, he says, is Christ divided? What's the answer? Pardon? No. No, Christ is not divided. This phrase, is divided, is the idea that Christ is sort of sliced up into whole lots of dis- different parts and different pieces and handed out to different people. That's, that's not true. Uh, the idea is, this whole idea is actually very grotesque. Paul's painting a grotesque picture here. It's like taking a human being and carving him up into pieces and sending him out to all the people. They did that in the Old Testament, you know. It's grotesque and it has to be rejected. Jesus is our Lord and there's one Lord. And Jesus gave his all for all who would come to him in faith. You didn't get a piece of Jesus or a part of the Spirit when you got saved. You got all of Him. Christ gave us everything. And the gospel preached by Paul was Christ. Christ, not a part of Him. Christ and Him completely dead, crucified on your behalf. Why did He have to die? 
Because without the death of Christ, there is no forgiveness for sin. If you're, if you're in sin, and you are born in sin, the Bible says, then today, and you're in sin, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then, dear friend, if you were to die today, you would find yourself being cast out from the presence of God, because sin cannot enter into heaven, because not only is God perfect, heaven itself is perfect. And the only way to get into heaven is for you and me to humble ourselves and bow the knee and surrender to the finished work of Jesus Christ and to his authority and his resurrection. And, the, and, and, and in that process, understand he is the only Savior. He is the only name given among men by which we must be saved. He is the only means for you and me to enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's not divided. There is one Lord, one Savior, one Redeemer, and Jesus Christ is the only righteous one and the only one who can give you the gift of righteousness and allow you to come into a righteous, holy kingdom. There's none other. If you're not clothed in Christ this morning, then you're in big trouble. Secondly, Paul, he asked the question, was Paul, was, was Paul crucified for you? What's the answer? No. No. Absolutely not. Christ alone paid the penalty for our sin. It, there's only one sacrifice. Christ was sacrificed once for all, the just for the unjust, that we, the unjust ones, might be justified. We, the unrighteous ones, might receive as a gift the righteousness of Christ and thereby, through that, eternal life. Christ died for our sins once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, 1 Peter 3.18. The third question he asks is, were you baptized in the name of Paul? What's the answer? No. 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 If anyone was baptized in the name of Paul, you're in trouble here. No, Christ alone is the, is the Christian's identity. Baptism is primarily about an individual identifying themselves with publicly with Jesus Christ, with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Death for their sin, burial, uh, being fully dead, and then rising from the dead victoriously for their justification. For me to live is Christ, Paul could say. And so we see clearly that Paul is saying their partisanship in this church, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, Cephas, I'm of Christ, is actually making a mockery of Jesus Christ and the gospel. And so Paul in verse 14 says, I thank God I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. And then he, he remembers, I did baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized any other. And I read that, and I think about that, and I think this, 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 the whole idea of baptizing for Paul was, was just, it wasn't at the forefront of his mind. What was at the forefront of his mind was the preaching of the gospel. And the implication is it's wrong then to identify any man's name with your baptism other than the name of Jesus Christ. So when people say, I was baptized by, and they name some big name Christian preacher, dear friend, you, you've got it totally wrong. He's nothing. He's a nobody. Only Jesus is Lord only Jesus' name and I, your identification with him matters. When you stand before God in a day to come and, and God asks you, why should I let you into, into my kingdom? There's only one name that matters. Because Jesus said I could. So the steps towards unity in the church involve heeding God's appeal, identifying the obstacles, and finally, number three, applying the means of unity, verse 17. In, verse, in this verse, Paul gives us the reason for the directives in verses 14 to 16. He says, for, here's the explanation, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, and it's the means of our peace and our unity. Paul reminds his, his readers that the priority of his commission is to preach the good news. Jesus is the way to God, he's the truth about God, and he is the life of God, and you cannot come to God and know this new life without him. It's impossible. 
And finally, he addresses those who are enamored by the rhetorical, the, the, uh, rhetorical prowess of eloquent human wisdom. And he states this. He said he was sent to preach the good news, not in cleverness of speech. Why? So that the gospel would not be made void. The gospel is a simple message. It's a powerful message. It's a transforming message. It declares men to be sinners in need of a savior, facing God's judgment and wrath. It declares Jesus Christ is the answer to our sin. He is the only means by which sin can be forgiven. And it declares the resurrection of Christ as the pathway to our justification. If we would only come by faith and trust and depend on him and him alone. How do you get from Taradale to heaven? By believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this idea of believing, this idea of faith, which I said is an intellectual belief that leads to an action, this faith must have the right object if it's to be a saving faith. There's lots of people who have faith. I, I have lots of, I'm having lots of faith right now because all these bridges we're driving across, I, I, I'm, I know what went down here a few months ago, and I'm thinking, are these foundations good? Like, I didn't stop and check the bridge. I just drove right, right across it after my fearless leader, Jack Barley, and, uh, and I'm just driving across these bridges. But, you know, inside I'm thinking, hey, I know a bridge in California that they just blew up because the foundations of the pillars were undermined by a flood. But anyway, I'm still here, praise God, because my faith is in the Lord. It's not in the bridge, right? And the good news is that Jesus Christ went to the cross in your place. He himself bore your sin, 1 Peter 2.24, in his body so that you might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you can be healed. So we can conclude from these verses that unity, OBC, will come through the clear exposition, explanation, and surrender of our lives to the gospel of Jesus Christ and its implications for our lives. Some practical implications, and we'll wrap up with this for unity. Number one, what do, what's this message mean to you and me? How do we, what, what do we take out of it? Number one, don't seek your identity and meaning in life through your association with other people. Don't do that. Seek to die to self and live for Christ. Let Jesus be the only identity you need, the only praise you need, the only encouragement you need. He is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. Two, there will be no unity and peace in relationships in this life without the Prince of Peace inhabiting the throne of our hearts. Three, the church is to be heaven's outpost of unity and peace and comfort where we reflect the unity and peace of God to, the, to a broken and hurting world. And we do that most powerfully by loving one another. Jesus said, if you love one another, the world will know that you're my disciples. Fourthly, true worship of God is expressed most effectively in a local church through relational unity, which is, which is an overflow of our agreement and our, our sharing, our partnership in Jesus Christ. Fourthly, the effect, fifthly, the effectiveness and power of the cross is that through death to self comes life. True power, God's power. It's manifested in lives of meekness and humility, not prideful positioning, not eloquent words of worldly wisdom. And lastly, self-interest, or two more, self-interest must be laid aside for self-sacrifice and lives of praise and glory to God. And lastly, Christian relationships are built upon and sustained through the unconditional love of God, which is sacrificial, giving, selfless service of one another. So let's remember this. Let's remember that in the kingdom of God, down is up and up is down. Jesus said, the first shall be last and the last shall be be, and the last shall be first. Jesus said, the greatest among you is the one who is servant of all. Let's pray. Father, help us to strive for unity. Help us to protect unity, your unity. Help us to grow in this. Help us to grow in our love for one another. Bless this congregation of your people. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Christ. Thank you that we can stand and sing and praise him and glorify uh, him together, that we can share in communion and all the things that we do as a church because of him. We love you, Lord God, and we continue our worship of you now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.